Now let's get to the heart of the news with our commentator who will give us her personal take on the events and issues of the day. And today we have the journalist, political affairs commentator and Arise news analyst, Dr. Constance Ikoku. Good to see you and thanks for your time. Good to see you, uh, Suleiman. <laughs> well, uh, quite a number of issues, uh, pot-proof issues, uh, but again, Nigeria is uh, about one thing uh, amongst all, and it's about subsidy. And our conversation with a man who's uh, uh, been a liberal leader and a governor and a party leader uh, speaks volume. Now, let us in on uh, first uh, the conversation we had here on Arise with uh, uh, Comrade, uh, the NLC president, who specifically spoke that they were unexcited, uninterested about those who were having the meeting with them. Uh, but perhaps it looks to uh, President Tinubu to have rethought about it and brought in people like uh, Adams Oshomale. Uh, who finally was able to broker a peace with the other team members. What's the understanding of labor, labor and labor politics of politicians on the other side to help Nigerians understand where we are at the moment in terms of uh, understanding subsidy removal? Well, labor was planning a showdown with the government up until yesterday and then today we, we heard that the planned nationwide wide strike had been called off for obvious reasons. Um, they decided to go to the negotiating table with uh, the federal government. That has been seen or considered as a reasonable move by labor rather than shutting down the whole country. We have been discussing fuel subsidy removal for at least 24 years in this country. 24? Yes, at least. And we've had painstaking, robust debates about this particular issue. Um, you know, there are those that are for and those that are against. And everybody has talked about it. This time around, the issue for many people was not that the president announced it on the day of his uh, uh, swearing in. Talk about landing in hot water on that particular day or hitting the ground running. <laughs> he did it. And I think there will be more rough waters. He should be prepared for that. Anyway, some people say it's the manner that he went about it, not the announcement per se. So, for instance, if you're going to announce that kind of uh, big news, you have to have prepared to cushion the effect before you make the actual announcement. Because what happened was that it triggered panic buying. And then, you know, before you knew it, uh, price of food, prices of food skyrocketed. And even transportation is quite expensive now without having put down uh, the necessary measures that will cushion the unintended effect of this announcement. And mind you that this is a country that is, um, you know, we have gross inequalities within our society. We have had persistent inequalities for many years. And so there are people that this kind of announcement will disproportionately affect. So you have to think about it, take your time, plan it out before you take the move. I think that's where the uh, issue was between the general public and the president. And there seemed to be something changing, Constance, and it has to do with the general public. and. Uh, uh, on Newsnight, uh, our correspondents uh, who across the country uh, gauged opinions and the shock uh, is many Nigerians I spoke to, you know, a cross section of Nigerians also said, well, it's an okay thing, we don't want subsidy, but the timing was wrong, we don't want subsidy, but there should have been palliatives. What do you think has changed uh, to this, uh, you know, shocking understanding of the ordinary, some of the ordinary Nigerians out there? Is there an understanding? People are still hoping that this is not true, <laughs> that this is not actually happening. I, I think a, They're a still in people, a state of shock I, I think or disbelief. So. Yes, disbelief. Uh, because all of a sudden, you're buying fuel for 500 or more than 500 naira per liter. That is major, especially in, in light of the fact that most people run businesses, small and medium-sized businesses. Then you have to buy you know, petrol, for your generator so you haven't provided electricity now you have to pay three times more to fill your generator for the whole day if you're a business that runs from 9 maybe to 5 or 6 p.m 
it, it's, it's going to be tough, it's going to be difficult. And then some people have said that, uh, yes, there are so many countries in West Africa where fuel is not subsidized, and so we shouldn't do that in Nigeria. That's not the accurate argument to make. All around the world, it shouldn't be either or. Most governments decide how to make life easier and better for their people. Some subsidize agricultural produce. You know, there are a lot of farmers, you know, they go to farm, they don't worry about whether the products, you know, get bad. The government pays for it, it's heavily subsidized. This is to help the population. For some people, it's uh, subsidizing electricity, energy, transportation. I'm very delighted that um, Comrade Oshomala mentioned mass transit. In Abuja, for instance, Abuja is a modern city. It's still developing, it's still growing. You do not have mass transit. Isn't that shameful? I think a lot of people will consider that very shameful. You need to have mass transit in a, in, a, in, a, in a big society like this, in the capital city of the country, apart from trains. Have buses at least, where people can pay a little something to take them to and fro. So these are things that you need to think about. That means that you're working for the people, you're thinking about how your policies affect the people, and then you plan it out, you know, for the long term. Now let's talk about some of the key things uh, now that, that also aligns to some of your points. Uh, and uh, TUC specifically, the Trade Union Congress has said, uh, has reeled out a few things that they would want the government to put in place by the end of June. Uh, but uh, the big headline that many journalists are taking off uh, the long list has to do with the take-home pay of the average Nigerian. They wanted pegged a minimum wage at 200 thousand naira. Uh, I said the smile on your face. <laughs> but again, in the face in the face of looking at the, the 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 strength of the naira against the dollar and what we produce, uh, how feasible is that? Look, I smile because I know that's going to be difficult. So the minimum wage is thirty thousand. You're asking for two hundred uh, thousand naira. That's reasonable in the normal circumstances. But even think about the government is already borrowing 800 million to, to use for the palliatives. <laughs> they are borrowing. They don't have that money. Where are they going to get 200,000 to pay you? I don't know how they, they will pull that off. So the point then becomes we have an underperforming economy. The point is the government is not generating enough revenue. So you have to work actively on the economy for the long term. Because if you're robust, if you're buoyant, then you generate enough money to increase uh, wages, increase benefits, other conditions. Uh, I, I, can, I also hear that labor asks for a review of the national health insurance scheme, asks for social policy uh, for their workers. Of course, they also ask for direct subsidy for food items. And then there was um, there are a couple of other things, all within their right, all what you know a normal country should do for their citizens. That's why you have a government. But you know the president even inherited a broken country, a country that is uh, you know highly indebted. So there's a lot of work to be done to find that money. I do not know whether they will agree to that two hundred thousand um, a month, but the focus should be. The economy, the economy, yeah. it has to work. It has to work. If it doesn't work, I, I do not think any of this would take off. L let me quickly by now uh, say to our, our, our viewers that we're meant to have a uh, uh, comrade uh, Osifu here, who's uh, the president of the TUC, but uh, he just called uh, close to the program time uh, to say he's still in a meeting. Uh, because some of the key things here, uh, let's go back to some of the things Oshomale also raised. Uh, comrade Oshomale also spoke about oil theft. He also spoke that, uh, about cutting down waivers. And I asked him what kind of waivers. And he said, you wouldn't believe it, the kind of waivers Nigerian, some very wealthy, influential Nigerians get uh, from the government. So let's talk more about oil theft. Because I also recall that and there was a time uh, Tony Lumelo and his uh, company uh, cried out to the extent that, uh, well, they virtually not get anything from, you know, the oil point. Everything is stolen. I'm glad he raised those points. Those are great points. And um, we should look at those. Um, oil theft, yeah. not only oil theft, we have, um, we need to reduce uh, 
the cost of governance. If you're asking people to sacrifice fuel subsidy and sacrifice on their part, the government should be doing belt tightening. There should be belt tightening measures. It shouldn't be only for the ordinary Nigerian. Everybody at the top, uh, you know, the big people, the big businesses and government officials, they should also be doing something. There is a lot of I, waste. I, I hope this is not the same as uh, many years ago. You remember the phrase, the policy austerity measure. Uh, no, it's, it's not the same thing. Those, those were World Bank measures. So if you're going to take a loan, there are you know, certain conditions they give to you to, to, before you take a loan. Look, we have to be serious in this country. So you know, re reducing government waste, yeah. that, that's one. Um, reducing the cost of governance, tackling graft, that is very important. Every government has to make tough choices. Yeah. Most times, they shy away from them. President Buhari shied away from a lot of tough choices that he could have made. Restructuring is a tough choice. Fighting graft is a tough choice. Um, so pruning down the civil service is a, is a tough choice. The other parastatans and, and, and government agencies that literally do nothing or that have uh, functions that overlap, that's a tough choice. You need to do all these things. And so if you're looking at the bigger picture of an economy that you want to perform, you have to sit down and have a team to begin you know, to, to tick yeah. off and actually take the action. So if President Tinubu has decided, yes, this subsidy is going to go, well, there was no provision for it after June anyway. <laughs> so there wasn't any provision except he decided to do that. Well, there's no money anyway if he decided to keep it. So if he's going to take, you know, he's taking this tough choice on the economy, he needs to do a lot of work. I, I hope they are able to get it together. And, you, you know, you talk about uh, restructuring, which is uh, uh, very important here as the president and many of his key followers are uh, big proponents of restructuring. Do you see the president, you know, actualizing or activating the process again? This president, Bolatin Mu, has changed over the years. Remember, he used to be an activist as well. And he was one of the arrowheads of restructuring big time you know, when he was in Lagos before he became the governor. Because a lot of Nigerians saw and agreed that this was a foundational issue that had to be dealt with in Nigeria. And of course, he saw himself as a progressive. Today, they call themselves the All Progressive Congress Party. We don't know how progressive they still are. I don't know if he even remembers that this is something that needs to be done. So we just have to watch and see and believe that, you know, this president understands the deep problems of the country. The scars are very deep. You don't want to take measures that are shallow, measures that are convenient. You know, you talk and you run away. No, you know, if, if he has done this, uh, we hope you know, to, to see that um, other tough decisions that he follows through. So it's still early days. We're watching. And, uh, you know, reducing the cost of governance, uh, does this also, uh, you know, uh, pan down to, you know, uh, appointees of government? Appointees? Well, I saw in the news that um, the, the president asked the National Assembly to appoint 20 advisors, I, I, I think. Um, I don't think that might be a problem, not only for the president, but when you look at uh, the entire ministers, so we have how many ministers? I think 36 or 37 ministers. So when you look across board, how many appointees people come with or, you know, to, to the government. Um, it could be part of that. But deeper than that, you know, if you look into governance, there are so many areas where money disappear in this country. And you see people that in, in government that live large. I'm sorry, I'm going to say this, you know, a lot of people might not like it, but you see government officials that have 30 children. And then you, you're wondering, you're a government official, your salary might not be so fantastic. How are you able to fend for this number of children, one person? What, what about the fleet? Uh, you know, now that we're talking about subsidy, uh, the long line, uh, endless line of cars following, uh, for, for, for instance, uh, one political appointee. It's part, of, it's part of that. It's part of reducing the, the cost of governance. It's part of reducing how also, for instance, there are so many government officials that are in power. When they are leaving, the cars go with them. I think every four years you have to change cars, not only 
for the presidency, maybe in the National Assembly. There's all sorts that goes on. So if we're a serious nation that truly, truly wants to um, move forward and be progressive as the name of the party, this, you know, it says this is, these are some of the things that we need to look into. Yeah, because uh, the petrol doesn't come uh, for free. And uh, if, uh, if we're talking about a removal of subsidy on petrol, then definitely you can imagine the amount you spend to put petrol on that long line of cars. Exactly, exactly. A lot of money spent on so many different things, you know, pleasure, you know, travel. There has to be belt tightening measures across board, not only for us, the ordinary people. Well, certainly we have, I think the president has a lot to do and it looks uh, just uh, as if uh, he's uh, started work uh, in earnest. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for your time, Constance. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Constance. You're Ikoko. welcome.